Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jane Hewitt and I'm the Capability Building Coordinator at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand are part of the Info Exchange Group, a not-for-profit social enterprise that tackles the biggest social challenges through the smart and creative use of technology. And for those of you who haven't attended a webinar with us before, Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand facilitates an annual training calendar of online webinars, workshops, boot camps and webcons to help the social sector upskill in all things digital. So welcome today to the webinar, Digital Innovation for Non-Profits um, and dig um, sorry, Digital and Inclusion. And before we begin today, we'll just start with a bit of housekeeping. All lines are muted, so if you have any technical issues, just type them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel and I should be able to help. And if you have any questions during the session, please type them into the questions box and we'll have a Q&A coming up at the end of today's session. Please note that your comments and questions won't be visible to the rest of the group. And please note this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a copy of the recording and the slides towards the end of today. And we do send out a very short survey at the end of the webinar and we'd really appreciate any feedback, whether that's good or bad. So that is all from me. I will pass over to Marcus to get things started today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jane. And I'm really excited to have Tim, Jason and Francesca here today uh, talking through their experience and hopefully giving you some really great ideas that you can take back into your organisations. But first, I need to give a huge thank you to Victorian Government for putting on the Digital Innovation Festival and supporting this webinar. This is the third in a series of five over a fortnight that have been specifically designed for non-profits and have covered tech foundations, digital marketing, uh, this one on innovative service delivery, uh, as well as um, you know, a whole range of other topics that are presented by organisations, not just in the info exchange as part of the Digital Innovation Festival. I would like to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'm joining from Bunurong land in the Kulin Nation, but recognising that you will also be joining us today from all over the country. We pay our respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Now, it was through our work with nonprofits in the early days of COVID that the need for the Digital Transformation Hub became apparent. Many organisations, especially those with servers and desktops, were struggling with the transition to work from home. Uh, we found at Info Exchange that we just didn't have enough time to help everyone that needed assistance. And that's where the concept of the hub came about. With the idea of bringing together the best of nonprofit technology so that organisations can have help and guidance on their journey to transform their operations and thrive in today's COVID normal world. With this in mind, the hub has been developed to include a digital capability quiz so that you can understand your strengths and your weaknesses and where you might wanna focus in terms of uh, your improvement priorities some case studies so you can learn from others who have been through this process, uh, not just Francesca and Jason on the, on the webinar today, but another dozen organisations and how they've made it through their technology jungle. More than 50 separate guides and uh, technical resources uh, and management resources to help you build your organisational capability a huge range of training resources so that you can build your skills and your staff skills to use technology effectively. A range of expert advice. Uh, you can book an expert for both with the Digital Transformation Hub team, you might speak to Tim, you might speak to myself or one of our other consultants or senior consultants. Uh, we've also got a bank of volunteers who are excited to help organisations all around Australia make the use of technology, and of course, a huge range of technology discounts for nonprofits, because we know that every dollar spent on technology is another dollar not spent on service delivery, and it's really important to get that balance right. 
If we move to the next slide, you'll see that we've broken the technology jungle down into five technology domains. Uh, and today's webinar, I'm thrilled to, to you know, cover all of these in terms of how we can uh, build innovation and service delivery. But this is really today about that information systems, reaching out to clients, reaching out and enabling staff, um, and helping organisations work more effectively wherever staff and clients might be, particularly when you can't see people face to face. The other areas that we're focusing on in the hub is that foundations, so PCs, network servers, infrastructures, information systems, capturing information to measure your impact and uh, deliver efficient operations, digital marketing, helping organisations reach supporters and funders to have the biggest possible impact, IT management, making sure you get bang for buck with every dollar, and also cyber security, keeping your uh, information safe um, and making sure you protect it appropriately. But I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who's going to cover the rest of the webinar and talk with the presenters. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Um, first of all, I'd like to extend an acknowledgement to the original innovators of, of this land. I'm, I'm joining you this morning from Camagal country, um, part of the Eora, Eora Nation. Um, and I extend a welcome to you and the lands from which you join us today. Um, I'll be doing a more extensive introduction to our guest speakers, Francesca and Jason, shortly, um, just before they share some case study uh, case studies with us. Uh, just building on some uh, housekeeping, do please get involved in the chat. Um, it's always good to share experiences, knowledge and networks. Um, as Jane suggested in the introduction, um, the session will be recorded and the slides will be made available for your uh, later reference. Um, so please do get in involved in the immerse yourself in the content as it's delivered. Um, we have plenty of time at, towards the end of today's session for, for questions, hopefully about 15 minutes. Um, we, we find in these sessions that that really does uh, get some really uh, good benefit for, for the audience. Um, just to give you some advance warning, I will be running a couple of polls in, in the session really to help configure uh, the content and the material uh, to, the, to the needs of, of, the, of the room. So today's agenda, um, essentially I've split it down into three sections or four sections here. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a very brief introduction into the Australian innovation scene, um, particularly uh, configured around the not-for-profit, uh, the social enterprise and the for-purpose space. Um, I then want to introduce you to Francesca Arambo and also Jason at each in order to get a a real uh, insight into how they have interpreted technology for the ben benefit of their organisations and then we'll go into a Q&A. So first of all I'd like to really get an understanding uh, with Jane's assistance um, on running a poll. Um, I'd like to, I've, I've given you five opportunities here on the poll to get an understanding of, of who we have in the room. This is really to help um, uh, both Francesca, Jason and I uh, configure the delivery of the content we have today uh, for, for who's, uh, who's with us. So really running through the options, um, are you uh, someone that's studying or you have an idea for an enterprise, so you're very, very early stage, are you a founding um, member of an organisation um, today, do you work and support a not-for-profit from inside the organisation, are you a, uh, a supporter from the ecosystem, are you a volunteer, are you an ecosystem champion, or are you an investor or funder to help uh, not for profits grow. So we'll just leave that open for a couple more seconds. There we go. So mostly in the room we have people at work. 78% of the audience uh, work in not for profits. Okay, that really helps. Thank you very much for your contribution there. Um, what I'd like to do now for the next 10 or 15 minutes really is immerse in the innovation ecosystem in Australia and maybe introduce you to a couple of concepts that I've certainly found very useful as a technology practitioner for, for over 25 years. Now, it, it may not surprise you that the last 12 months has been a very, very volatile year. Lots of change, very dynamic, lots of it's very fast and unforeseen. Um, it may also uh, not surprise you that uncertainty has been uh, an unpredictability of events and circumstances has really challenged the environment in which we operate. And, and in many cases, the technology we use, how we use it, and what we use it for. 
the environment in which we operate these days is increasingly complex with multiple forces and, and issues at play. And, and lastly, um, things are becoming increasingly ambiguous where uh, it's confusing, it's hazy. Um, the cause and effect is, is, is less clear than it maybe used to be. So that, that this is really just setting the scene for building up the rest of uh, the elements of innovation. Um, I've used this uh, information I gained from um, actually the Fin Review in 2020, uh, September last year. A survey was done uh, around the amount of technological adoption that happened in Australia uh, in the first six months of last year and compared it to the prior three years. Uh, in Australia last year, we saw 10 years of accelerated change um, specifically in fields of healthcare, retail, education and logistics. That may not surprise you when you realise that maybe telehealth or click and collect and e-commerce, education, online learning and learning from home and logistics around supply chains. But specifically in front office functions, web presence, where people were having to uh, update a website or, or the, the front of house capability, but more specifically in the back office, HR systems or stock control. What do we have? Where is it? That kind of stuff and this is not um, specific to the the corporate sector this is certainly something that's very relevant uh, within the non-profit and social enterprise space as well so i just want to refer now to the not-for-profit technology survey that info exchange uh, conducted last september where 490 organizations in australia and new zealand uh, were um, invited to provide feedback on their use of technology um, and these were a number of organizations from one person organizations right through to 500 um, in, in size. Um, the main themes that emerged from this were that many organizations were not prepared for, for what happened um, from a technology um, agility point of view um, both from security, maturity, satisfaction, confidence that kind of stuff um, which really was part of the genesis behind the uh, Digital Transformation Hub. But more specifically, I'd like to delve today into the emerging technology section and really look at how we can use uh, emerging technology and innovation to really sustain and lift um, the impact within uh, the not-for-profit space. So Jane, I have another poll kicking off uh, here with your help. Um, what I'd like to really do is get an understanding in your organizations today um, I've had to use the data set that was used uh, last year with InfoExchange, so there are, there are five options here. Um, you can actually choose as many of these that are relevant to your organization as possible, um, but going through uh, mobile apps and bulk SMS, data analytics, data-driven decision-making, assistive technologies, maybe virtual and aug augmented reality, uh, voice and speech recognition, perhaps drones and Internet of Things, which ones of these options do you uh, use today in your organization. So click as many of those that are as relevant as, as they are to you. Thank you, Jane. I think we're probably Okay, good. Well, that's um, I, I was I, Internet of Things. I wasn't expecting that to be as high as 39%, but that's that's interesting. Um, bulk SMS, mobile apps, 58%, data, 70%. Um, yeah, so th those top two really don't surprise me. Um, I would expect them actually to be higher than that. Um, wh what I'll do now for those that haven't uh, seen the results from last uh, last year, th these are the results that were actually canvassed amongst the uh, amongst the 490 organizations that provided uh, input. So 52% of them were actually using one of these technologies at least, um, but they do vary in maturity. So for example, bulk SMS has been around for well, at least a decade, um, mobile apps uh, less so, but then there are some more very, very uh, new breed technologies, drones, internet of things is very much emerging at the moment. Um, I just want to dwell on the, the voice speech recognition point that we do actually have uh, world le leading capability in Australia around uh, voice and speech recognition. There are actually something like 160 PhDs between Sydney and Brisbane uh, that not many people people know about, and it's a really interesting interface 
um, to, to maybe consider in the future. So one thing, I, I'm very interested in how we harness technology for um, social good. And I've recently been doing some study with the Institute of the Future in the United States. Um, and they have a very interesting kind of methodology to how you can actually harness um, emerging technology for the benefit of your uh, organization. And uh, what I want to run through here very, very briefly is a, it's a bit of a neuroscience hack tool to really prepare you to imagine um, different futures. Um, and the way the tool works is if you're able to look back 10 years from today, you will see that there are many alternative pathways to get to the same um, point in time. Um, unfortunately, those, those pathways are historical and therefore closed to you. Um, however, what you can do is then transpose that over into the future and you will find that that opens up many, many possibilities in the, in the future, which are actually currently open to you until they're closed. Um, the, the title sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, imagine the past, remember the future. You think, how possibly can you do that? But the idea is you're trying to create alternative pathways in your own brain or your organization's brain to create um, alternative possibilities. And what I love about this is it really encourages um, ri ridiculous ideas. Um, and, and to me, you know, it may sound ridiculous at the outset, but in actual fact, it becomes a very um, relevant, relevant idea. Um, the other point worth mentioning in passing is that um, as, as the speed of change speeds up, um, today is actually the slowest point um, uh, that we're actually going to experience in, in change. So I just want to bring you back to kind of Earth a bit and, and really the import, um, bring out the importance of developing a technology plan. So it, it's great having all this new technology out there and all these different things that you can do, but it's very, very um, important that these map to specific um, goals or objectives within your organization. And this is where the Digital Transformation Hub can really assist you in the, the kind of foundational capability to build that up. Um, for, for your organization. So if you're not already familiar uh, with the Digital Transformation Hub, strongly encourage you to, to hop on there. Um, Mar Marcus, Marcus uh, made an introduction to the five sections that uh, we talked about um, earlier. Um, I, I won't really dwell on this too much, but really that each of these areas have uh, something to contribute towards uh, accelerating your, uh, your digital strategy. Um, and very briefly, um, a bit of a promo slide there. Um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about technology adoption, adaption, and then also some uh, material around uh, the startup scene and entrepreneurial thinking in Australia. Oh, sorry, skipped ahead. Um, so if we look at uh, technology adoption over the last hundred and so years, um, it, it, it took about 50 years uh, for technology to be adopted by 100% of the population. Um, these days, it's, it's 25 years or less. So the speed at which technology is actually being fully um, consumed or uh, taken up by society is, is increasing. That, that presents a challenge for those in, in organizations uh, wanting to um, select, because there are usually many options, uh, the best fit for purpose um, solution for their particular organization. Now, um, you, you've probably heard the, the phrase technology hype, maybe chasing shiny things. Um, it's actually a real, very, uh, a very real thing. Um, if you look at um, technology over time, expect, expectation changes. So if we start on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, where technology is very primitive, very early days, very much kind of in the lab, the research and development, um, expectations quite low and confidence starts to build. Uh, over time, and that's when um, the, the broader community starts to get uh, exposure to, to technology. But it's at this point, um, peer reviews or, or uh, people wanting to challenge the technology start to find holes in it, and that's when it dives into uh, the chasm or the, the trough of uh, disillusionment. And it's at this point there's some consolidation, there's some maturity, and technology starts to recover but never quite to the level of hype or expectation that was there before. 
Um, it, it's probably around this point, which is called the plateau of productivity, where the mainstream um, you and I will, will, will adopt and use technology. But if we look at, um, uh, and if you look at the whole scale across um, how long technology is around for, probably, I don't know, 20 years or so these days from the beginning to, to retirement, um, it actually means there's a very uh, narrow sweet spot of probably about 15 years where technology is uh, relevant to your, um, your specific uh, needs. So, um, I, so I think best practice is the area we're, we're really looking um, to consume technology. Um, now, the, the point I really want to make here is that uh, probably 80, 85% of um, market adoption is pragmatists, conservatives, skeptics. Um, we're, we're not really, certainly in the, in the not-for-profit space, we're not really looking at the innovators and early adopters. That's very high risk. Um, you, you could end up supporting something that, that really does go nowhere. Um, but the, oh my, sorry. The point I really want to make is that uh, the uh, the point on the far right where mainstream support expires, this is a point that you really do need to be aware of, that you're not adopting technology too late. Um, this means that new releases or patches or security is no longer provided and adopting technology to the right of, uh, of that, um, you know, that, that point um, is actually adding risks uh, risks to your organisation, and I do see a lot of people uh, or organisations, not not only in the not-for-profit space but um, elsewhere as well, where that that does happen. Um, I do want to jump themes a little bit now and start talking about um, startups and uh, the entrepreneurial space that I've really been um, immersing myself for the last um, five years in Australia. There's a lot of great um, innovation, and there's a lot of great um, problem solving going on in this space. Um, if you look at um, mapping ideas or problems, solutions to uh, the sustainable development goals, um, you'll come up with two visions of this, uh, this wheel. So here you've got, um, it's the same data represented in two different views on the, on the left hand side by year founded um, and on the right hand side by maturity. Um, each dot represents uh, an individual organisation um, and you can see that uh, the clustering um, is actually quite dense in certain areas. So, for example, affordable and clean energy is very, very busy um, and others uh, a lot less so. Um, there are probably, I, I don't actually know the number, but there's over 2,000 startups in, in, represented in these uh, diagrams, um, but there are probably billions of dollars of um, investment capital, whether it's philanthropic or corporate or philanthropic, gone into it, behind um, all of these organisations. Um, one in particular that is very close to my heart and I've been involved with for probably six years is um, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance have a startup accelerator called Remarkable. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a fantastic example of um, human-centred um, design. Uh, where, where people with deep lived experience um, are supported through the founder journey to build um, an organisation to uh, develop and build and offer technology that uh, solves a specific need. Uh, and many of these organisations are actually um, in, in Victoria. Um, th these organisations uh, in their early five years or so um, have already uh, secured over $30 million in uh, capital. Um, last couple of slides here. Um, I just want to um, reference, um, if we look at the global kind of landscape, and there's two points I want to make on, on this slide. Um, the 40 most innovative brands globally. There are a couple of themes that uh, emerge from this uh, information. One is that seven of the top 10 most innovative brands are actually technology companies. Point one. Uh, point two is 50% um, of these organisations are in America. And that really kind of sets the theme for where, where Australia is at the moment. We have a bit of a two-speed challenge in Australia. We are, um, as consumers of technology, we're actually in the top one, two or three uh, adopters of technology, very quick to consume, 
uh, and, and, and adopt uh, new technologies. However, we are somewhat more laggard-ish um, in the mainstream innovation and technology readiness. If you look at the World Economic Forum, um, the kind of pillars of technology readiness and innovation, with the exception of research, academic research, every other measure, if you look at the highlighted yellow sections, we're actually pretty poor and, and dropping. Um, the danger is we're building a nation that is, um, we're very good customers of an app store, which tends to be hosted overseas. And that presents some unique challenges um, uh, here where we don't necessarily have uh, local capability. The other point that's really, really important, certainly for this audience uh, to dwell on, is that the inclusion of technology is vitally important. And we haven't, we've seen that become even more pressing in the last uh, 12 months. Um, digital inclusion is a real challenge in Australia. Something like 2.5 million Australians are not online. Um, certainly in the above 55, 60. Um, yeah. So that's uh, a real challenge. So just uh, my final two slides. Um, just in closing, um, the five areas that uh, recent Deloitte um, Access Economics um, report around technology suggests there are five main themes around technology in the future. Uh, working from home, probably no surprise. Um, E-health services, so an uptick in uh, telehealth and, and such. Uh, E-commerce, click and collect, um, purchase online, on, online learning and so on. And also digital government, which we're seeing um, certainly um, in in many, many of the corporate uh, government services that are provided increasingly digitally. So really, uh, to close, uh, technology and innovation is vital to the sustaining um, operations and the scaling of impact of, of organisations in the not-for-profit sector. Um, Australia can do a lot more and must do a lot more to innovate um, or risk being just a great customer of somebody else. And uh, I just want to re reiterate the importance of an IT roadmap um, to make sure that you have some structure and discipline to help uh, support your overall um, organisational uh, goals. Um, I do have some uh, recommended reading, but I'll, I'll send that through in the pack. Um, I, there's some great, great resources here around innovation and, and technology that are very approachable books. They're certainly um, not, not techy in, in, in any way. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, really hand over to Francesca to talk us through the Umbo story um, and really um, help us understand how technology is uh, supporting the delivery of um, regional and remote Australians' engagement with a, a number of um, occupational and speech therapy services. Uh, Francesca, if I could invite you up to the stage. Hi, thank you and thanks very much, Tim. Um, I learned a lot in that last presentation, so I really appreciate it. Um, firstly, before I start, I would just like to acknowledge that I am today on um, the lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So the UMBO story, um, UMBO is a social enterprise that um, it has been designed um, to use technology and our intention is to reduce inequality in access to healthcare in regional and rural Australia. And so UMBO was co-founded just over three years ago. There were three co-founders and we all have varied backgrounds, but we all have the one very common social purpose, which is how do we reduce the ongoing and perpetuating inequality that if you live in a regional area of Australia, you don't get access to the same types of services that you do if you live in a metro area. And why we're so concerned with this is because we know that families that live in regional areas who have children with high needs around varied kind of disability and different levels of um, allied health services needs just don't get the access. And when I say access, it may be access to um, over time. So they have long wait times to access allied health services. They may have to travel very far distances to access allied health services. And they're simply just not the services there. If you're a family who lives in an area like this and you have the, the difficulty of travel time but a child or a family member with a disability, it's a very, very complex system that you're working within. 
Umbo is seeking to support the Sustainable Development Goals, and thanks for mentioning those, Tim. Um, we work with, within Sustainable Development Goal number three around health and wellbeing, and number four around quality education. We are also a social enterprise that uses technology to achieve our social purpose, rather than a tech company that has a social purpose. So I think it's a really important delineation because for us, technology is a way to provide a social impact. And I think seeing that there's 78% of not-for-profits on this call, people who work in a not-for-profit, um, you'll know that the impact that you're trying to have is the core of your business. And I'm gonna talk you through in a little moment just about how we do that. So really Umbo's vision is to ensure that communities and particularly rural and regional communities are supported to grow and thrive. And the way that we do that, or our mission, is that using online methods, we provide allied health professionals into areas that don't have access to those supports. And the way that we do that is by supporting families. We work from very much a person-centered care model. So the expert in that person's life is, is the person. It's not us as the clinician, it's not us as the therapist, it is the person. So we actually work from their goals, we work with their community, and we work across kind of the entire spectrum of their life in order to achieve those goals. Tim, would you mind popping to the next slide, please? So why is this important? Because I think for myself as well, prior to um, working with Umbo and having my family, I wasn't as understanding of the impact of not having access to allied health services. And so Umbo primarily works with speech and occupational therapists. But what we know is that young children with speech and language impairments are at risk for continued communication problems, as well as associated cognitive, academic, behavioural and psychiatric difficulties, as well as social problems. And so what happens that if children get access to these services, um, we can actually see a very long term impact of not having access. And that can be, you know, within literacy, across education, across a varied range. And so what happens is that um, children start behind and then they continue to fall behind academically or socially. So a lack of social connectedness um, as well is a big problem. Tim, next slide, please. And so when we apply the complexity of, um, of disability and the complexity of location, and there's a whole range of things, we actually see that kids in these areas, the system does not support them to, achieve, to access um, health services. And so this is just a very basic systems map of where you can see that things like poorly integrated services, complexity within the NDIS, a lack of government commitment. Um, so the current model, if you live outside of a metropolitan area or outside of a large regional area, is that you have a fly in and fly out therapist. But what you see is you get poor continuity of care and what you don't get is actually um, a great level of care for each of for clients. Um, families maybe don't have the funding, um, particularly rural families don't have funding. And you also see a lack of therapists in those areas. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how <clears throat> what Umbo is also doing is increasing a work, like increasing the workforce and solving a supply issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we need to understand our why and we need to understand the complexity in order to apply a technical solution to help solve this problem. And what we're really comfortable doing at Umbo is actually sitting within complexity and saying, actually, the problem is really hard. We don't know really how to solve it, but what we're going to do is apply multiple different solutions to try and solve this problem. And one thing I think, Tim, you touched on before is around, I think, being a social enterprise, we have the benefit of being fairly agile. We have the benefit of being a little bit risk um, open to risk and to try new things. And so one of the things that we talk about a lot in um, within Umbo is that we we test, we test things a lot. So we test different tech platforms, we test different approaches. Our core is always the same. It is about the social purpose and helping pre people get access to the therapy they need. But really we are able to actually work within different kind of tech models to test different things. And so, as I said, what we do, we provide person-centered care in an online environment. And so our therapist can be based anywhere across Australia and our client can be based in a, you know, thousands of kilometres away, but they can still get access to the therapy that they need. And so what we're actually doing is we're putting the person at the centre of the care that we are providing. So Tim, if you could pop to the next slide, please. 
This is really what we do. We try and understand the ecosystem of that individual person. So we look at their individual characteristics. We look at the environment they're in with their family and friends, their community infrastructure, the social infrastructure, the policy and the environment. And we can see where we as an organisation sit. So for example, UMBO sits within that community and social infrastructure. But what we do is we provide care that wraps around all those different things. So really, I think the unique part about UMBO is that we're actually using tech to solve a problem in a very thin market. So we know that there's no services out there in rural and regional areas. So what we are doing is using tech as a platform in order to bring services to families. As a social enterprise, like I said, we actually have the benefit of being a little bit more agile and flexible. Um, and we actually are really comfortable in understanding that there is complexity within this ecosystem that we work through. That said, it's not without its challenges. Um, and so we do have a problem, oh, a challenge, I guess, and it swings and it flows and it ebbs and it's really tricky is that we have an untapped supply of therapists. And so just to explain that a little bit further, 98% of speech therapists are female. And so what we have found is that there is a, 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 a group of, or a, you know, a therapists who are no longer working, they may be running their own small clinic or they may be at home looking after children, but the current environment, the clinical environment maybe doesn't suit them. And so what we are doing is we are trying to find that untapped supply. So the benefit of using technology is that you don't have to turn up to a clinic between nine and five every day and then be a clinician. You don't have, you could do the, your therapy at seven o'clock at night if that suits your family and it suits your clients. So what we're trying to do is actually open up a market um, because we know that there is a low supply of therapists. Um, and that's the benefit of technology as well. You know, it wouldn't happen if we didn't have this. Um, we're also, so what we're doing is we're kind of solving a problem, not just for families, but we're solving a problem for therapists and for an entire workforce. It has been an interesting experience during COVID. There has been different, um, we saw initial uptake of many, many clinics trying to jump into the telehealth environment and UMBO was able to support lots of clinics because we have been doing this and we have training in, and we deliver training. However, what we really have seen and we're trying to move past a little bit is that people feel that telehealth is a nice thing to have for now, but if we could just go back to the clinic, it would be okay. And so what we're trying to do is help people understand that telehealth is a great thing to have in your toolkit and it may work for some families, it may not work for other families, but actually how do we make sure we have this in the toolkit? And the other thing that we're trying to do is not reinforce the current power structure, which means that therapists are still located in cities and actually not in the rural areas. And so we're trying to bring people together and find the therapists who live in the regional areas. So I think that UMBO is a bit of a case story of using technology to solve a problem that exists out there. Um, we have certainly changed from the beginning where we started, the, the um, structure that we had when we first started around technology and how we would use technology. We had ideas to build a great digital platform, but actually, there's platforms out there that we can use to actually tap into. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but actually when we go back to that individual, we actually really need to spend more time now understanding what does it look like and what do our individuals and our clients in regional communities need. And so now we just go through that testing process, understanding what we need and building on that all the way. So really my key takeaways is technology for us is a way to achieve our social purpose and achieve our reach, especially when you have a complex problem like we have here, uh, uh, like what we work towards at UMBO, um, that it's really hard to solve these complex problems and wicked problems, but actually um, if you can use innovation and scale, then actually you can start to make some headway. And that if we know our client's needs and we look at those individual characteristics and the client within their ecosystem, then a tech solution is a great way to try and solve those problems. Thank you, Francesca. Um, love the Umbo story. That's that's just so awesome. Um, I'd like to just uh, introduce Jason now. So Jason is the uh, Chief Information Officer at uh, EACH. Um, providing a range of health, disability, counselling, mental health services across Australia. Jason has over 20 years experience leading, leading technology delivery uh, and management across both not-for-profit and commercial sector. So the stage is yours, Jason. Thank you very much. 
Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for, for allowing me the opportunity today to talk a little bit about the experience of each. Before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'm going to pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging um, as we move forward. Thank you very much. So, next slide, please. And this is a quick logistics, Tim. How long have I got? Have I got about seven minutes? About five minutes. <laughs> about five minutes. All right, I'll try to squeeze this in. Ne next slide, please. All right, so EACH is a non-profit community health organisation, and it provides a range of health, like disability, counselling, mental health services across Australia, mainly on the, the eastern seaboard. And it's an organisation that's been around for about 40 plus years, uh, providing healthcare and uh, wellbeing to the community. Um, our motto is we believe that everyone is entitled to good healthcare um, and we service the community with about 140 services uh, reaching up 60,000 plus clients um, and in the environment we're at the moment two of those services are around screening clinics around COVID and with the vaccine um, air, air clinics across Australia as well. So yes we're right, right in the front of it um, and uh, yeah, enjoying servicing our community. Next slide, please. So what I'll quickly talk through today is just a little bit about how we met the challenge around technology, uh, and then talk a little bit more about some of the ways that our business were able to take those things and adapt it. The idea being is if we can sit back and think about that, yes, not every solution requires a real hardcore tech solution, is that, that our business were able to take some of these and use some common sense ways to marry up some technology with other ways to make simplified engagement with our, with our clients. So I'll talk a bit on the, on the technology side. So when, when COVID hit, we, we were hit with a, little, a bit of a technology challenge. We had a, approximately 1,500 staff uh, that all needed access to information and we had a significant limitation around our VPN connectivity, particularly around licensing and actual physical uh, limitations. So we expanded our, our authentication gateway and we were able to publish the majority of the apps that people needed to use to this and get them connected up quickly. Helping us on the back end of that was the fact that we'd, we'd already started to move some things like SharePoint and our email exchange over to the 365 environment. So we were able to take that, that front loaded work and expand on that and give people connectivity to a lot of the applications that they need to reasonably quickly. Now, obviously understanding that not every organization may have that, but it was an experience that we still needed to go through to get people connected. One of the big things that was really useful was, was that rapid rollout of MS Teams um, across the organisation because it got people talking and being able to meet in that virtual space really quickly. And more importantly, where we had people who were physically locked to a location and needed those physical phone systems, we were able to spin up Teams calling and actually get them connected in that space so they can continue their work there. So I can't speak more highly about how great that rollout of MS Teams was in helping us move forward. On the back of that, there was a lot of things like getting user guides out to staff, getting simplified instructions, getting them out to people very, very quickly so they could access these things. So they weren't sitting there going, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? But then we got on the front foot and, and, and released this information to staff quickly so they could start to use all these tools that were available to them. On the telehealth side of things is we, we made sure there was a number of platforms that we tried to get out there quickly. So clinicians could start to pick and choose what made sense for their particular client set. So what worked for one set didn't necessarily work for others. If you were doing an alcohol and drug related service, it was a different mode to, depending on whether you were doing other forms of counseling. So having multiple methods like telehealth, Zoom, we were able to use Teams, mobile phones and another couple of methods meant that clinicians could work best with their clients. The other thing that underpinned things, we really had to accelerate our mobile strategy, getting laptops out and upgrading our security on the back end, given our friendly neighborhood cyber security, our cyber criminals were out there in full force. Tim, can I grab the next slide, please? This is where the, 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 the discussion becomes a little bit more interesting because whilst we put some things in the back end which made connectivity easy for our staff, is how they used it. And I've put up here a couple of examples because I think they, they highlight that ingenuity with the business. So 
I'll talk through, so clinicians started to drop packages and relevant materials at people's driveways. So whilst technology provided them with a method to talk to their clients and have their sessions, it was their thought process to work out how they could actually engage better with their clients that made that experience that much better. So for early childhood interventions, they dropped off games and activities. So when they sat down with those sessions, they could sit together and run through those rather than having this dry conversation just purely in an online world. Our social groups particularly, so given the fact that the whole purpose of the social groups was to get people together, and then we were told to socially distance, created a, a unique challenge. So they started handing out, for some, particularly some of the older adult groups, iPads, and then started running online training sessions how to use them, which actually became one of those clients' favorite sessions that I've ever been to. So running those classes and giving them a mode to actually get to it. The virtual tourism one was one that I was really impressed about because it was a great idea. So our, again, with our social groups to help socially isolated community members, someone would act as a tour guide, spin up a session where they had the video conference and then walk around and actually do online tour guide tourism seeing you know places of interest different towns and then they could interact with the community members on the call and make them feel like they were out and about and they could all talk together in that in that space the last one actually became something that spun up uh, almost by itself so they started one of the a client shared a photo and then that spun up a whole conversation around oh, why did they take that photo? What were they feeling at the time when they took it? What was it about? And then all of a sudden with the online community members, they started talking to each other. And then they actually started sharing photos between them. And this sort of spun up a whole sort of, let's call it network of isolated people that could connect with each other in a virtual world you know, and, and, and share these experiences. And that became a really good phenomenon that brought people together. The last point I'll make, um, the online de delivery of some of our services, it's funny enough, we were expecting some drop off, actually led to some higher engagement. And I think, what, what, and particularly with things like alcohol and drug related services with gambling help and, 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 and drug related services, what we found is that being online and in the, the comfort of your own home meant that some of our community members were more willing to interact with the services than having to go to a physical location. So I suppose the takeaway for a lot of people to think through is that online world doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be reduced ability to service our clients and sometimes being able to, to innovate around that means that we can actually sometimes provide a better service and more needed service to our clients than what we could do face to face. So don't be afraid to try those different modes of, of communication. I think that, that I'll, I'll stop at that point because we want to leave a bit of time for questions. Um, Tim? Thanks, Jason. That's that's awesome. Um, what, what I'd like to do now is just invite uh, Francesco back on the stage and, and maybe Marcus. Um, I've got a couple of uh, priming questions that I'll, I'll ask as well. Um, really, really to get an understanding around uh, so Francesca, really, uh, I, I, it may not be a stretch to say that um, yourself and your co-founder aren't native technologists. How, how have you navigated the technology landscape to get what you need and want for, for the organisation? And then I'll ask Jason a question and hand over to, to Jane and um, field some questions from the audience. The irony of that question is not lost on me because I'm one of the least tech savvy people in the entire world and regularly, uh, it's a regular joke between one of my co-founders and I. Um, yeah, look, I think it's it's really interesting. It's, um, yeah, we're definitely not tech founders and I think that um, actually in a way it gives us a little bit of an advantage because, well, not an advantage, but it's a different approach. So we will approach to understand the best tech applications that we can apply um, to our business and for our clients based on their needs. So it means that we're not swayed in one direction for any particular type of, um, of application or type of tech. Um, it also means that when we're thinking about building something in the future, if we were to build an Umbo style platform, um, 
we don't have any preconceived notions of what works for us and what works for our organisation. It's actually we're asking our, um, our beneficiaries, what is it that you need and how can we create um, the best platform for you? And that would be both our clients and our therapists. So I think in a way, um, not having much knowledge about tech hasn't been too much of a disadvantage at the moment. I think if we were to go deeper into the tech path as an organisation itself, we would obviously need to bring in those skills for sure. Um, but I think it's meant that we can be very agile and very open to different ideas and different technologies. I love that answer, Francesca. You, you've, <laughs> you, you've invited the technology community into your problem domain space to really help solve your solutions rather than the other way around, which is yep. sometimes problematic. So really the flip side of that question really for Jason, um, as a native technologist, how, how have you taken taken non-technologists in your organisation and the broader community on, on the journey of, of adopting uh, technology? I think it's a, it's a simplified sort of response. It's it's really that rich conversation between the people who are more, let's call it the coal face of actually providing the services to our clients and understand their needs are very close to that and having that dialogue internally with myself and obviously with the, the greater leadership team. One of the really good things that this organisation did right at the start when we, when the pandemic hit was we, we had a, a task force that was spun up that was speaking daily around what was going on so we could get feedback from the people who were providing services and actually get that through to us and then we could react to that and make sure that we were providing back at the same time. If you think of those examples that we talked through, that was very much our, our on the ground people working out, well, how do I take this piece of technology and then marry that up with a way that's gonna work well with our clients? Um, and that, they were awesome at doing that, they really were. Oh, that's great, Jason. Um, Jane, I'd like to invite um, any audience questions that you may have, um, or, or maybe Marcus, if he's got some questions, if Jane hasn't. Uh, we have one at the moment from Ruth. Uh, Jason, did you use the Government Be Connected resources to help teach beginners with learning about technology or other resources? No, I think we've mainly stayed within a, a lot of our main um, uh, connectivity, so things like Zoom, uh, and, and the other platforms that we put up. So telehealth services uh, were provided through a DHS platform uh, and that, that was a, an easy rollout because that was provided through them and then we found it fit for purpose depending on, on the mode that we needed to, to go through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Um, Thank you, Jane. Oh, sorry, Jane. Another, oh, sorry, sorry. There's another one from Carolina. Um, how can NFPs become more agile and innovative when they are risk averse? I'll, I'll start with that question. I, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question and it's not unique to not-for-profits. It's something you can apply uh, technically across Australia. So in my, my comments around Australia really has a, a bit of a challenge around innovation, um, risk aversion and, and certainly at board level um, is a real challenge. Um, I, I've, uh, and it's probably why I'm drawn to the entrepreneurial um, innovative kind of community who are native problem solvers. So I, I would really encourage you to connect with that kind of um, ecosystem because there are some very committed um, problem solving kind of people. Um, I don't necessarily know how you embed and take that on later, that, um, but many of these organisations are looking for uh, case studies or examples where um, not necessarily the solution can be um, adopted, but they're looking to solve genuine, genuine need. I might, Francesca might have a, an interesting take on this because uh, uh, Umbo has recently been through a kind of a startup um, journey with a whole bunch of supports. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Francesca, on your experience last year. Um, I probably, not necessarily from, I mean, we've got a lot, a lot from our experience last year, but I guess for me, technology provides you as a way to to maybe scale and to innovate. And so I guess the thing is, if we take it back to the needs of, um, particularly not-for-profits where you're constricted with your funding and you're constricted with various kind of, you know, regulatory requirements. If there is a way to use technology for you to have a greater impact, then that for me is a risk that you should take. And that is where, again, going back and asking your, um, your beneficiaries about what they need and how you can actually use tech to actually, you know, increase your impact. And, and we've seen it even at Umbo, you know, it enables us to reach people in remote communities um, who would actually not get services. Um, yeah, so that that's where I would go is, you know, if you can increase the impact using technology, then that to me is not a high risk activity. 
And, and, and it's funny, from my perspective, I've actually found that risk profile has changed significantly after over the last 18 months. So whereas if you'd asked me this question back in January 2020 about what the risk appetite for, for, for technology in nonprofit, I would have said that it's very different. Now I almost feel like I'm doing the opposite direction. I, I have people coming with all these things they want to jump into and I almost sometimes have to go, whoa, I, uh, it's, it, I find myself sometimes as a technologist starting to call the jets because obviously can't go into everything all at once, but it has been a very fundamental change um, over the 18 months as a need of necessity. Absolutely agree, Jason. And I think so. In in the last 18 months, the the kind of risk appetite has moved from very conservative to just get it mm. done. Um, but what that does mean is we have kind of bypassed a level of due diligence, which does mean, unfortunately, there are a bunch of um, embedded risks out there in the wilderness that we do need to get on top of and that's specifically a reference around cyber security so i do encourage people to do kind of a risk a risk review quite urgently to, to make sure that's um that's plugged jane any other questions uh yep one more from nicole uh she is saying it seems there are so many options out there and it's hard to know where to start what would be your best advice for the not so tech savvy people Log on to the Digital Transformation Hub. That was a planted question, sure. <laughs> no, so we, we, we're certainly trying to make this journey um, as approachable and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know um, so, something you can really engage with. Um, the, the, the number of us on the hub are really uh, a, a wide variety of expertise and support. Um, we do really need to be approachable and, and, and support you in, in the outcomes that, that you and the organization are trying to achieve. Um, the first place to start really is to go onto the hub and do the, the quiz that Marcus uh, talked about at the, the, the outset uh, of this session. Um, it, it's, it's a relatively um, simple five-stage um, assessment, um, really understanding the maturity of each of the capabilities within your organisation. And don't feel bad if you come out of that and you're basic or the assessment suggests you're basic, that's probably where 90% of the organisations are and it's the purpose behind uh, behind the hub. I don't know if Marcus wants to add anything on top of that. No, I think that's good. I would also be interested in Jason and Francesca's advice though, given that they've been through the process um, with their organisations. And I think it is really tough um, thinking about how to enable services um, through digital channels, and I think both you know both Jason and Francesca have have done some really great work in bringing together both the technology and the business side, um, and melding those two worlds, which is often the hardest thing. So, Francesca, I might start with you. What's your number one tip for someone looking to start down this journey? I think um, for us, it's and again, being a non-techie person is don't get overwhelmed by the technology because I think we expect it to be, we expect it to be really hard. Um, and, you know, we just try and really break it down and make it very manageable. And obviously for us, we're teaching our clients how to use the tech a lot of the time as well. And so that's our approach is just, let's not get overwhelmed. Let's try, have a bit of a backup plan, you know, as to as to how things go. But yeah, it's really not seeing it as this big, um, this big beast that um, you know that you can't sum out. You actually can. It's just take it down into manageable chunks. That's how I kind of see it. And, and yeah, I, I, I you almost paraphrased half of what I wanted to say, but I, I'm going to echo that again. So it's not feeling that the, the problem is too big. Is that if we can actually take off manageable bites and and, and then do a piece get it working and then move forward. You, the, the whole problem won't seem is, is insurmountable. The also these, don't try to over-engineer the solution. Sometimes some of the simpler technology solutions that are out there that are available, so leveraging off a lot of the things that things like Microsoft and, and the big companies can provide us, can actually be introduced rather quickly. And then if you can then add the business side of it to layer that into the way you service things, you, you'll get a good outcome without without a ton of investment. Thanks both. I think that's, that's some really excellent advice for organisations looking to move down this path as well. Jane, any last questions before we, we probably have to close up? Yeah, uh, one final question. Looking at the stats of online usage at the start, our entire client base have disabilities and many of our coaches, service providers, are around the 50 to 60 and over range. 
If they are unlikely to use the internet, how should we approach that? Great question. So technology is not necessarily the answer to, to every every question, really. So I, I would always default to using, um, you know, you meet people on their terms or in their environment that they're familiar with. So there may be some very bridging kind of non-technology solutions supported by tech, maybe for the people enabling uh, the solution, um, for sure. But uh, I, I actually... Uh, I heard recently that the digital inclusion stats have actually changed quite radically in the last uh, 12 months. I referenced 10% um, of the Australian population are not digital natives, um, but because of the pervasive use of QR codes, everyone seems to have to use them, uh, the digital inclusion numbers have actually changed radically, but I wouldn't really consider the, the use of a QR code you know, qualification of digital um, maturity. I think there's a, still a lot more we can do. Um, uh, around that space. I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in. I, I, I suppose I'll, I'll come back to that example that we used um, around providing some devices and helping out our older adult community because very much that community is, is the ones we're talking about that aren't necessarily the most tech savvy um, out of the, cohort, uh, the whole cohort. But providing them with a device and then a, a means to actually learn how to use that upped our rate of people engaging with technology, but the outcome was that it actually became one of their, their favorite sessions. It really really was a was a shift. So now they're engaging and enjoying themselves in a space and learning that skill set at the same time. So it's probably a great there's, there's a great plug for a cost harbor not for profit um, which is actually com, um, combating uh, digital literacy among seniors but also youth unemployment where there's there's very large unemployment um, amongst youth communities in, in Coffs Harbour and they've actually they give paid employment to, to disengaged youth um, to get them to go and teach seniors how to use technology and it's a really good means of practicing soft skills and so on so youngster.co I'd strongly encourage you to, to look them up I, I, I love what they're doing um, but there are probably many and many other examples around that I would certainly look at uh, um, Good Things Foundation they, they're supporting a number of organizations around libraries, men's sheds, whatever, around digital literacy, and they have thousands of digital mentors across Australia. Um, so that's part of the, the government's um, connecting, um, not connecting up, <laughs> Get Connected program, very similar. Um, Marcus, I'll, I'll throw back to you. I think we're probably over time. Yeah, no, I'm good. I suppose my, my number one um, thing that I ask everyone to think about is one, Use the Digital Transformation Hub to help. Where there's something particular to what you need, just book time with an expert. We'll set you up with a conversation. Don't give one-on-one -on -one advice. Um, and that's what we're really keen to do. COVID's not going anywhere. It, we're, it's here to stay, unfortunately. But that has really brought a whole range of evolution in a lot of the organisations we're working with. And those that have given something a try, like Francesca and Jason, and expanded upon it, without investing too much to start with, giving something a go and, and exploring is what's absolutely critical. And I do love some of the stories from both of them about how they worked and, and melded both the in-person and the digital spaces, uh, particularly for those that aren't so digitally literate. Thanks so much for having us today. I'll hand back to Jane uh, to close out the webinar. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you, everybody on the panel, for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and please do keep an eye on your inbox. I'll be sending along a copy of the slides and this recording um, along to everybody at the end of today. So thanks once again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.